Hello, hello everyone, it's Martin, aka Anders, and today, as I alluded to in my last video, I'm going to be taking a look at Icebox. I know I've gotten into the habit of talking about new agents as they've been released to the game, and thought it only reasonable that I start doing it for maps as well. I also think it's going to be fun to take a bit more of an abstracted, theoretical perspective on the maps, as opposed to some of the more on-the-nose, first-impression type reviews that we see on these maps thus far. That said, let's hop right into it. To lay a bit of groundwork, the way that I want to tackle this is by dissecting the map's attributes into three major categories, elaborating on those three points, and then explaining how they converge into a major overarching strategy for the map as a whole. The first of those three categories, and what seems to be Icebox's unofficial buzzword, is verticality. Icebox is really interesting in that it takes our pre-existing notions of multi-planner gameplay and completely upends them. It's no longer a simple matter of, we call this heaven and we call this hell, it's, we call this heaven, we call this hell, and there's three levels of gameplay in between. Whether that be flying around on a zipline, or standing on top of vents, or teleporting on top of yellow, there are numerous planes of gameplay that have to be constantly considered. This play dynamic, of course, is going to feed into the power of the agents who can make use of it. Those are predominantly going to be Jet, Omen, Rays, and to a far lesser extent, Sage. Making use of these vertical play elements is going to quickly become a necessity, whether that be your Rays boosting on top of Tube to enable a B-take, your Omen TPing on top of Yellow to prevent a B-take, or your jet bouncing around inside of a site floating between platforms to get an ideal angle on whichever portion of the maze your opponents seem to find themselves. The next major characteristic we're going to take a look at is one that most people intuitively understand but don't think about concretely enough when forming strategies, and that's angle saturation. On a more theoretical level, angle saturation is concerned with how much space in a given area can be used as a functioning angle. A great example of a low angle saturation area would be a site on Haven, especially if it's being peaked from a long. The number of potential angles that that a long player is peeking into is staunchly limited. You have the two sides of Heaven, you have close right, you have close left, and you have the far left angle that they could be peaking from hell, meaning that the saturation of that A-long peak is five angles. Something that is far more dramatic in comparison is if you're peeking into the A-site warehouse on Icebox coming from the attacker's spawn. Obviously, you'd have to be a verifiable psychopath to swing it this way, but the circles just go to show the multitude of angles that you are actively swinging into when you try to move into this area. When addressing high angle saturation, the most obvious things immediately come to mind, flashes and smokes. Interestingly with Icebox, however, there are so many narrow corridors and jiggleable corners that, at least in my perception, flashes go down fairly significantly in value. The rationale there being that the number of corners you would have to flash through to get meaningful value is so high that you're going to be out of util by the time you make it halfway to a site. If we reflectingly pivot our attention towards smokes, we can see immediate and vast improvements in the way that certain parts of this map can be played. By using two of three brimstone smokes here, we're cutting down the angle saturation of this particular space by around half. If you're feeling really spicy, and this is where she shines the most, Viper's ability to cut angle saturation is absolutely unparalleled. She not only greatly improves the peak ability of that initial angle, but angles all the way to the plant zone of A itself. This wall and the vent's poison cloud can be thrown from a completely closed and safe angle towards attacker spawn, and takes less than 4 seconds before the Viper can rejoin the team on the push. And that brings us to the last of the three major categories, and this is what I call an option mid. An option mid, or at least how I personally qualify it in a strategic context, is a singular long corridor middle lane that allows for simplified and quicker access to both bomb sites on a two site map. We see this very much so on split. We see it in a modified sense on Ascent, where the doors hamper the openness of the option mid. We don't see it at all on Bind, instead having that option capability shifted into the teleporters. And on Haven, the option mid technically exists, but it's simultaneously the B bomb site. 
Now that we've reached the point where we have what are, in my opinion, the three most defining characteristics of this map, we can pivot into theorizing a composition that actively abuses those characteristics in an effective way. That lands us with Breach, Jet, Killjoy, Omen, and Viper. An incredibly unusual composition for what I think is an equally unusual map. Let's go over and highlight how this composition can take advantage of all of the attributes I just described in a single offensive set play and execute. The round kicks off with two dark covers, one blocking tube and the other one blocking boiler. The team proceeds to five stack push mid with breach flashing them into the second portion of mid following the containers to the right. This is where things start to get a little bit hectic. Breach will flash in the team to the defender spawn portion of mid as Jet updrafts through the dark cover that is on boiler. Simultaneously, Viper will be toxin screening the front half of A site and poison clouding the entrance towards the screen end of A site. Jet and Breach will have cleared defender spawn at this point, and while Jet holds the angle, Viper will drop her Poison Cloud as a Paranoia and Fault Line are simultaneously dropped by Breach and Omen, functionally slamming the entirety of A-Site from its flank. Queuing off that pressure, Killjoy and Viper will push onto site, quickly followed by Jet who will updraft on top of screen as Omen and Breach wrap around the back end of A-Site to take rafters. As the team rejoins on either side of A-Site, Breach uses the final one of his flashes through A-Site Nest to clear the back rightmost portion of the site. At this point, Jet plays up onto the pipe box in front of A-Site Nest, Breach goes and plays Far Corner Rafter, Omen plays around A-Site Nest, Killjoy places her turret in the bottom right corner of A-Site to cover the flank, and Viper plays her wall inside of a close corner in the center of the A warehouse. From this position, Killjoy can plant in front of A nest, Viper can bounce line up a poison cloud to block rafters, and there is an extremely powerful lockdown of this site at this point. You have four player, two plane coverage of the defender spawn side of the A site, while Viper and the Killjoy turret have a crossfire on the back half. Jet gets to play a second plane on the pipe bench with her entire flank covered by the toxin screen on cooldown and the spike positioning allows Killjoy to play intermittently through toxin screen breaking LOS while still being able to hold her angle. This is just one example of how a map tailored strategy could very easily take advantage of Icebox's inherent characteristics over and over and over again even inside of just a single round. From the get-go, we're taking advantage of the option mid by pushing up, using an A rafters wrap to offset any sort of defensive positionings. Halfway through the push, we're already using Jet's updraft onto boiler to take advantage of verticality. Then the toxin screen goes down to take advantage of angle saturation, not only while we push the site, but enabling us to actively alter angle saturation of the defenders if they decide to flank us from the attacker spawn side. Beyond that, we take advantage of verticality again in our post plan by putting Jet onto pipes, as well as leaving Breach on rear rafters. Overall, this strategy is the perfect example of how I think more teams should be approaching map-tailored strategies. And so that's what I've got for Icebox, at least for right now. I've got a couple more trade secrets that I gotta keep to myself, obviously, for the teams that I work with, but I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts down below. At this point, I mean, some people have had tons of time on the map, some people have had a little, and some people have literally not played it yet. Where do you stand, and what do you think of it? Obviously, there are a lot of pros right now who are vocally less than hyped, um, and I totally understand why. This is probably the uh, second most exciting map that has been released in Valorant thus far, by my personal metrics. I'll let you see if you can guess which one was the first. Uh, but eager to hear your guys' thoughts down below. Do you hate this map? Do you love this map? Do you think that I'm fairly on the right track with the way that I've sort of archetypally categorized it and how I think the map should be looked at from a strategic angle? Or do you have your own take? Do you think there's a composition that may be far better than the one that I gave as an example? Would love to hear how you guys think about this sort of stuff. Uh, per the usual, if you're enjoying my content, please don't forget to like and subscribe. I'm trying to grow this as much as I possibly can. And the more of you guys that stick around, the more motivated I am to push this stuff out as frequently as possible. 
You can also find me on Twitter and Instagram at AndersTV. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.